so dependent on them. Looking at that, as I say, later. But it is Friday, November the 22nd. And I am about to ask a question which is meant to be, well, some years ago, was one of the most oft asked questions on the planet. So where were you the day that Kennedy was shot? I'll ask you that question now, by the way. Tell me your stories. I'll tell you mine. I vaguely remember it. I vaguely remember it. My dad ringing my mum, who then put on the telly and just looked very, very upset, but I couldn't quite understand why. So I really was a little, little lad at that time. And we'll also be looking at Life and Times of an extraordinary man, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, in one case, a true world statesman. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. But on the other, a phenomenal adulterer, a string of conquests, once saying he couldn't get through the day without having sex or he'd have a headache. Conquest Marilyn Monroe celebrating his birthday. Peter Ling is author of a new book, John F. Kennedy. He's also Professor of American Studies at the University of Nottingham. Professor, if you... We don't seem to have Professor Ling, do we? Where's Professor Ling? Have we got him here? Yes, but then we do. Professor Ling, if you had to sum up what the world lost on this day 50 years ago, what would you say? Well, they lost a consummate politician who probably produced the celebrity politics that we've grown used to today. How would the world have been different had he, had he been with us, had he served his term, possibly two terms? Well, it's going to be, very, it'll be interesting to calculate. His friends, the uh, people who like John F. Kennedy, think we would not have had the Vietnam War. We would have had an America more committed to detente. We would have had a liberal America. The Cold War might have ended sooner. There is a romantic legend about JFK that still circulates, and that's the positive one because he cultivated a lot of optimism both in America and internationally. There is another side, the darker side, that uh, one can uh, argue about, about what JFK would have done if he'd had a second term. Such as what, Professor? Well, he was not keen on civil rights reform. He was not a champion of civil rights. He uh, was much more likely to cut deals with Southern Democrats and therefore might not have got the Civil Rights Act passed. He was a wealthy man with very little understanding of what the poor were going through. He might not, therefore, have pushed as hard as Lyndon Johnson did to address issues of poverty in America. And he wanted to win the Cold War. He didn't just want to cut deals. He actually would have preferred to have seen Castro toppled in Cuba, to have seen Vietnam remain um, out of the uh, communist sphere. Uh, and his biggest fear was that China was going to get the bomb and he was negotiating with the Taiwanese about a possible attack on Chinese nuclear facilities. So he was, uh, he was a very ambiguous figure. Later in this hour, we're going to be talking about how Britain as a nation is hooked on pills, pill poppers. The president was a sick man. He had to take as many as it, 12 a day. Yes, I mean, he was an incredibly sick man, probably the sickest man ever to be president. What, more than he Roosevelt, this... would you say? Pardon? More than Roosevelt, sicker than Roosevelt. In some ways, I mean, Roosevelt's condition when he comes to power is stabilised. The polio is paralysed from the waist down, but nonetheless, um, maybe the first two terms, Roosevelt's fine. But Kennedy is taking this regime of steroids and painkillers. If your listeners know what a really bad back pain is like, that's Kennedy's day almost every day as an adult. And uh, he's taking painkillers. In addition to his regular doctors, he's going to see kind of quacks who are giving him uh, amphetamines. Uh, there may well have been some recreational drug use. So this is a president who um, is probably more hooked on pills than the British people are. <laughs> um, which makes his uh, sexual exploits even the more remarkable. Well, yes, one does wonder how he gets the energy. Um, <laughs> nice way of putting it. Are, yes, I mean, there's also... Um, there is some sense that the ladies involved not spend a lot of time with John F. Kennedy. <laughs> 
brilliantly put. Check out Professor Peter Ling's new book, John F. Kennedy, Professor of American Studies at the University of Nottingham. Listening to that, Christopher Phelps, who is an American historian. So, Mr. Phelps, how might American history have been rewritten had he lived? Well, uh, that's uh, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, I am myself very skeptical of the claim of his admirers, his liberal admirers, most prominently Oliver Stone in the movie JFK, which is a fantastic movie as cinema, but dubious as history. In what way, Mr. Phelps? Uh, uh, The claim is made there that the reason Kennedy was assassinated was largely shadowy private and Pentagon interests who thought that he represented some sort of threat to the continuation of the Cold War, and particularly uh, an obstacle to their desire to have a deeper intervention into Vietnam. But since Kennedy increased U.S. military advisors in Vietnam just in his few years in office, 1961 to 63, from 2000 to 16,500, since those advisors were flying on combat missions since uh, Kennedy authorized the CIA to have a coup against Diem, who was the ruler of that country, and that inaugurated the whole series of military dictatorships that followed, unstable and precarious, each of them, and all propped up. It doesn't seem to me that he represents an exception to the pattern of the U.S. from the Second World War on, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the Big Muddy, as it was called by the troops who fought there. So I I think he would have escalated just as Johnson had. I think he was just as fearful of the right. The McCarthyist imprint on Kennedy's imagination was that you might always get sandbagged by somebody who said you lost China, uh, and he didn't want to be the one to lose Vietnam. So so in a way, for the... And please, I'm sorry about the brutality of this, but in, for the Kennedy aura to survive as it has, he needed to be assassinated, because otherwise we might have seen him waltz, for, waltz and all, Mr. Phelps. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, th- I think American liberalism fragmented and shattered in the late 60s. I think that Johnson pushed through civil rights in a way that Kennedy, had he survived, might not have, although he was already on course to do it, the... Civil Rights Act was put through by Johnson and Kennedy's honor, but it had already basically been proposed by the Kennedy administration. Uh, he, you know, he deepened things in Vietnam at the same time sure. and and caused the country to fragment politically and uh, in a very divisive way. And that it was sort of the apex of liberalism and the undoing of liberalism. And I think for liberals, there's a fantasy that. Kennedy might have worked out different, that that would have been an alternative history, and it's a very tempting fantasy. Lastly, who killed him? Oh, well, it, it, uh, again, that's a vastly divided subject. You could look to the Cubans, who had a motive because he had tried to invade. You could look to uh, the defense establishment or the CIA, or you could look to the mafia, because Bobby Kennedy was actively per, uh, going after the mob, and the mob was upset about the loss of Cuba, in fact, because Havana had been a major source of income for the mob, all sorts of uh, prostitution and drug and gambling rings and so forth run out of m- m- Cuba. So, um, And then you could go by the Warren Commission report, and you could say that this strange man, Oswald, who had spent some time in the Soviet Union and seemed to be allied with uh, Cuban solidarity, but uh, clearly was also mentally unhinged, did it by himself. And with that, we'll never know. Christopher Phelps, American historian, thank you. Coming up after the news, we'll get a lift the mood a little bit, some of the wit and wisdom of President Kennedy, plus the ten weirdest conspiracy theories about how he was killed, and possibly some of the most riveting radio you've ever heard, a report of the actual moment. The president was shot after this. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. C ninety seven point three. Call zero eight four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Text eight four eight five zero. Tweet at LBC nine seven three. London's biggest conversation with Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Coming up, perhaps the most compelling audio.
That means a sort of uh, radio report. Audio you've ever heard about the death, the assassination of President Kennedy, plus the ten weirdest theories as to who or why that trigger was pulled. Serious stuff. So let's lift the mood a little bit before we get into that. Phil damby has got a new book out. He's, of course, a regular correspondent and friend to this programme. His latest book is The White House Wit, Wisdom and Wise Cracks, The Greatest presidential quotes. And I've got to be honest, Phil, when, when you think of Kennedy, certainly without doubt, great power, powerful orator, but didn't know that he was that good on the, on the one-liners or the gags, Phil. No, good morning, Nick. I think a couple of things are going to put me back on the antidepressant soon. That's England's batting collapse overnight and the fact that I do actually remember where I was when Kennedy was shot. I'm that old. How, but as where you say, were you only a couple? Where were you? I, I, I was six. I was six. Yeah, oh, I remember yeah, it, watching my parents' black and white screen and we had a news flash and, of course, no rolling news channels in those days. You had to wait for the news later on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I still, to this day, remember the incredible shot. But uh, and Kennedy did you, did, were your mum uh, and dad? Were your mum and dad visibly moved? Were they upset? Yeah, they were absolutely really? deeply shocked. Yeah, and I think everyone oh, was. Yeah, and it, 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 it really sort of was something that uh, reverberated around the world. And yeah. uh, as I say, in, 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 in these days, the only thing you compare it to really is, is Diana dying yep. on nine eleven. I think. Yep. Yes, of course. Okay. So but anyway, yes, it, as we've a got humorist, great quotes from uh, from Kennedy in this new book, and some of his wit. Uh, of course, before he became president, he was actually a war hero. Uh, in the Second World War, he was in the Navy, and uh, he was once asked how he became a war hero, and he said, uh, it was involuntary, they sank my boat. <laughs> not a, <laughs> like not a lot of choice there, but um, he said, mothers all want their sons to grow up to be president, but they don't want them to become politicians in the process. Was <laughs> Interesting, you were talking earlier on about um, what, what his legacy would have been had he been uh, had a second term. And uh, he once invited over a, a prominent um, Abraham Lincoln historian, uh, David Donald, the White House, to give a lecture. And at the end of it, Kennedy asked him, uh, would Lincoln have been so well regarded had he not been assassinated? And uh, he said no. And Kennedy said, uh, well, if anyone's going to kill me, it should happen now, which was uh, rather prophetic, of course. And so it's rather fascinating to know whether or not, uh, whether or not he would have been as, as widely regarded had he, not, had he lived. But uh, certainly when you look, on, look back on some of that amazing vision he had, in particular, for example, in 1961, when he said to Congress that they were going to land a, la a man on the moon and uh, return him safely to Earth, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Now, can you imagine someone today, a bomber or somebody, saying we're going to send a man to Mars in nine years' time, eight years' time, and actually doing it? It was just an incredible piece of vision. Well done. Great. And a lovely range of quotes there from the President. Thanks. Phil Dampier, the book is White House Wit, Wisdom and Wise Cracks, the greatest presidential quotes. I wish I'd feel I'd given you my one from George... Uh, George H. Bush, um, very, very funny one, I must tell you at one time. I'll try and get it in before the end of the programme, but we've got a lot. But, well, actually, no, I will do it now. I remember using very much the theme there because um, President uh, Kennedy used that I Have a Dream and Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream, and I attended a what's called a, a White House annual uh, dinner, which is a sort of it's a massive fundraiser, and all the journalists go down there, and most of it's off the record. And the president has to effectively do a turn, and President George Bush Sr. got up and started saying, I have a dream, I have a dream for this great country. I have a dream for this great nation, and my dream is that one day we'll all be able to program our VCRs. That was a video cassette recorders, which were incredibly difficult, which from George Bush's dad, George Bush Sr., actually wasn't bad, because he was quite a serious fella. Coming up, the ten weirdest theories as to how President Kennedy met his end, but now a compelling piece of audio. I'd better tell you you're listening to LBC 97.3 because I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go away, but effectively you're going to go to CBS uh, many years ago in just a second or time, second or two. Let me explain. You're going to hear from uh, Dan Rather, who, of course, is for CBS News Anchor, a bit of a legend um, over in the US. And in part, he's going to refer to the Zapruder film. Now, the Zapruder film, just to remind you, this was a uh, shot by Abraham Zapruder with a home movie camera. He was an onlooker and he happened to be filming those scenes as the President Kennedy's motorcade went through Dallas, uh, Texas, this day 50 years ago. So he is credited with having caught the most important, incredible and vital footage of the moment that, the Ken that Kennedy was shot. So here's Dan Rather claiming he was the first one to see that Zapruder footage and later narrated the film for CBS TV. The film show President Kennedy's open black limousine making a left turn off Houston Street onto Elm Street on the fringe of downtown Dallas. A left turn made just below the window in which the assassin was waiting. Just as the president put that right hand up to the side of his head, he, you could see him lurch forward. The first shot had hit him. 
Mrs. Kennedy was looking in another direction and apparently didn't see or sense that first shot or didn't hear it. But Governor Connolly in the seat in front appeared to have heard it or at least sensed that something was wrong. He reached back as if to, to offer aid or ask the president something. At that moment, a shot clearly hit the governor in the front and he fell back in the seat. Mrs. Connolly immediately threw herself over him in a protective position. In the next instant, with this time Mrs. Kennedy apparently looking on, a second shot, the third total shot, hit the president's head. He, his head could be seen to move violently forward. And Mrs. Kennedy stood up immediately. The president leaned over her way. It appeared that he might have brushed her legs. Mrs. Kennedy then literally went on the top of the trunk of the Lincoln car, put practically her whole body on the trunk. It appeared she might have been on her all fours there, reaching out for the Secret Service man, the lone Secret Service man who was riding on the bumper of the car, the back bumper on Mrs. Kennedy's side. The Secret Service man leaned forward and put his hands on Mrs. Kennedy's shoulder to push her back into the car. She was in some danger, it appeared, of rolling off or falling off. And we described this before, there was some question about what we meant by Mrs. Kennedy being on the trunk of the car. Only she knows, but it appeared that she was trying desperately to, to get the Secret Service man's attention or perhaps to help pull him into the car. The car never stopped, it never paused. In the front seat, a Secret Service man was, was on the telephone. The car picked up speed and disappeared beneath an underpass. Yeah, this is LBC 97.3. That was Dan Rather for CBS News. They're commenting the first time, commentating to the Zapruder footage. Tanya in Pinner. So, Tanya, where were you the day Good the morning. shot rang out? Uh, the day I, I was working, I was in London working as a fashion artist and in a, a big fashion house up in the city. Yeah. And somebody came rushing in, shouting hysterically that, that Kennedy had been killed. And it surprises me now to think of the popularity of the man um, you know, it's, yes, it did reverberate all around everywhere because did, yeah. of his popularity at that time. And yet and, he hadn't um, actually achieved... A, I mean, he'd only been in power for a uh, little under three years, and you could yes, argue yes. he hadn't necessarily achieved oh, that much. Well, they were from a family of, I don't know what you call them, socialites or, you know, high-up uh, mm. uh, people. And, and um, his father, actually, was a... Um, the ambassador to Britain during the war. Yes, he was. He yeah. was Joe Kennedy. He yeah. wasn't a popular figure. Yeah. And uh, but he hadn't died at that moment, and it wasn't really till I got home I thought, well, you know, he'll survive. You know, it's America and everything. But by the time I got home, he had already died, and um, it, it was a very distressing time for everybody. And the speculation in all the years of who was responsible for doing that. And, you know, for the first time, um, I think everybody came into the fold of, of being uh, suspected. But um, uh, uh, the first time I saw a flash of documentary film where it showed you actually people holding up placards in Texas saying, um, Kennedy, the, the uh, traitor. Yeah, and I see that's really interesting you would say that because I thought that the whole nation adored Kennedy and it was only when I went and lived and worked there that they're, not that anybody wanted him dead, but he, he's not this mythical figure or status that he currently enjoys. When you actually spend time and you live and you work and you get with a wider range of Americans and you don't just necessarily buy the top line of the story, there was a wide side of it who really didn't like him, didn't like the Kennedys, didn't like the way it was going. 